episode of the Resilient Advisor Show. My name is Jay Coulter, and joining me for this episode is Connor Kitko of YCharts. And we're going to talk about a recent report they published that compares rebalancing strategies. Our mission at Resilient Advisor is to have a significant impact on the retirement crisis by educating and empowering financial advisors to better serve their clients. We bring you industry thought leaders and experts to help you make a difference in the lives of your clients. Going independent is incredibly rewarding, but most advisors don't end up in the best place for their business. They instead end up getting sold by smooth-talking recruiters, custodian reps, or worst of all, aggregators who don't have their best interest in mind. The Independence Incubator from Resilient Advisor takes a fiduciary approach to independence. Our clients pay us directly for unbiased guidance on the best path for their business. Don't get sold, get educated, and get unbiased guidance. Visit independenceincubator.com to learn more. Connor, I've long been a fan of Y Charts, the research that you guys put out, and of course, the awesome platform that you have for financial advisors. You guys recently put out some research on rebalancing strategies. For podcast listeners, if you'd like to pick up a copy, please go to go.ycharts.com forward slash rebalance. We're going to break this down. Connor, let's start at a high level. What was the premise behind this research? Yeah, Jay. So we have at YCharts a mission to help advisors both you know, arrive at investment insights and then relay those or communicate them to their clients. So one insight being around not so much what goes into a por- not so much what goes into a portfolio, but how we manage that portfolio. So we wanted to know as you consider different rebalancing strategies, you know, which is largely considered a risk management practice, can that have other impacts on the portfolio's performance, on how much time and effort advisors put in? And then finally, we added a really interesting layer where we looked at bull and bear markets and wanted to understand if rebalancing affects a portfolio differently during those different market conditions. So I tell you, what I found really appealing about the research is, A, it's easy to understand, and B, it's actionable. Because a lot of research on rebalancing strategies tends to get a little bit complicated and wonky as the authors try to outsmart each other, especially if it's a collaborative uh, issue. But what we're going to do is walk through some of your main findings in the report. So let's start with drift. So I'm throwing up a chart of historical drift by rebalancing strategy. And you know what, Connor, we should probably actually start with how you constructed this research, uh, how you built the portfolios and how that flows through this analysis. Right. So we built these all in Y charts using our model portfolios tool, which is a super powerful tool for running experiments exactly like this, whether you're testing different allocations or testing, like we said, that management. So uh, we created six different portfolios, all of a 60% equity and 40% fixed income allocation, just to serve as you know a representative portfolio. And then we also used five uh, Vanguard mutual funds in that portfolio, just again, as a representative, pretty common uh, funds that would be included in a lot of client portfolios. And then within YCharts model portfolios, the tool you have the ability to select never rebalance monthly, quarterly, or annually. We also have a portfolio drift calculation that we use to set up a drift triggered strategy. And so all of this experimentation happened within Y charts uh, using, like I said, that 60, 40 model portfolio. Excellent. And so, and, and I got ahead of myself there. So to break it down, the models are that you went back and did this research on are rebalanced monthly, quarterly, annually with a 5% drift, a 10% drift trigger, and then no rebalance at all. Correct? That's absolutely correct. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Now let's go look at the drift. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm throwing up a chart from the report and it shows the historical drift by rebalancing strategy. Walk us through what you found. Yeah, so at the very top of this table, at the top of this chart is the never rebalance portfolio. And so you can see, you know, starting in uh, the mid 90s is when this experiment ran for over 25 years of history. 
So drift slowly but surely increases over time, and that's reflected in the average portfolio drift of about 10% over that total 25-year history. Now, with every series below that, looking at the monthly, quarterly, annual, and then drift-triggered rebalances, you can see that the spikes where how far away from its target allocation a portfolio drifts, it increases and it, it's allowed to run a little further with the less frequent rebalancing uh, strategies, as one would expect. Um, the, the really clear uh, outcome from this is that we added the average drift to the chart. And you can see that those with more frequent rebalancing, you're going to be more often closer to that target allocation. Yeah. Which intuitively makes sense and Correct. really speaks to the validity of some of the other data points here inside and, and action items inside of this report. So then at, after we look at the drift, let's talk a little bit about the performance metrics that you found in this research using these portfolios. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so looking at uh, the cumulative performance over time, we basically just said, okay, 25 years of history, if you invested the same amount of money after those 25 years, what percent gain would you have seen? And the 10% drift triggered portfolio, which again, anytime the portfolio drift reached 10%, that's the only time that we would rebalance this portfolio, actually did the best of the group. And it stood out that the drift triggered portfolios came in first and second place in terms of cumulative performance. It's also represented in that annualized uh, performance figure, which is also in the legend of this chart. And at the very end, at the very bottom, or, uh, was the monthly rebalance portfolio. So we saw pretty clearly that monthly rebalancing had a damper on performance cumulatively. Now, I, sorry, Jay. No, no. What, what do you think the reason for that is? You know, it, definitely this whole experiment, the last 25 years, there were some bull and bear markets as we'll get into, but this has been against a backdrop of you know rising strong performance for equities and so since this was a 60 percent equity portfolio majority equities every rebalance every instance of rebalancing with that prescience that equities are going to continue outperforming is essentially taking a little bit off the table each time you do that yeah yeah we're going to get into some thoughts around what you actually do with that information now going forward as a financial advisor but let's talk about one of the more important aspects of rebalancing, why most people do it, especially if it's systematic, and that's for risk management. What did you guys find? We found that there really wasn't a huge or uh, you know significant difference in the risk uh, metrics for these different portfolios. Now, if you're someone who really focuses on things like the Sharpe ratio or limiting drawdown in your portfolios, you will see maybe a few points difference between the different strategies. Um, I think that this really comes down to your client's comfort level with how far those allocations stray from the target or from what you agreed upon uh, when constructing the portfolio. So taken in whole over this 25 year history, you know, you can see in the first column beta ranging from anywhere um, 0.595 in the quarterly portfolio all the way up to a little bit over 0.6 for the drift triggered and never rebalanced portfolios. Um, you know, that may not be the most significant difference in the world. And so I would go back to that, just how, how often are we over allocated to a potentially risky asset class uh, versus some of this data that we're looking at here. To me, this says there's not a super significant difference based on the different rebalancing strategies. Yeah, Connor, to me, this was the most, uh, this data stood out more than the rest of the data. And the reason is, look at the beta of the S&P 500. There is just not a lot of difference there. Obviously, with the VAR, there's zero difference. And then the shock ratios are all in line. The drawdowns are all in line. So some advisors might just be overthinking their rebalancing strategies based upon this if the goal is risk management. What do you Correct. think? I definitely agree with that. And I think that a lot of advisors, definitely us here at Y Charts, would say that rebalancing of some kind is, of course, beneficial, almost uh, required. However, it does, when you get 
super technical about it, it may not be worth the effort to, to really uh, choose one strategy over the other. But of course, we'll talk about that as it relates to market conditions. Yeah. In fact, that's a great segue. So you have some research in there about looking at the performance during bull and bear markets, and you pose this question to readers. Does it matter what you do during bull and bear markets as it relates to your rebalancing strategies? What did you guys figure out? Yeah, this one goes, again, back to our portfolio being majorly equities and thinking over this whole 25-year period from 96 to present, equities have been performing except- exceptionally well. Now, what we found was that during the bull markets, when our equity positions were allowed to run uh, with the, the less frequent rebalancing, that being the never or the drift triggered uh, strategies, by letting those portfolios run longer, we saw better performance during bull markets. Now, as you would reasonably assume during bear markets, those portfolios did significantly worse than those that rebalanced more frequently. Uh, we're also talking about bull and bear markets in the context of the S&P 500 of stocks. So a bull market in stocks may lead someone to rebalance less with a heavily stock allocated portfolio. We did not test the, the opposite being true for a heavily weighted bond portfolio. However, you would assume that uh, that holds true uh, in the inverse. We also found really interestingly, I thought this was one of my uh, most interesting takeaways from this whole study and writing this whole research paper was that uh, the never rebalanced portfolio topped the table in three of the four bull markets. Now, the one time it didn't take the first position was from 2002 post-dot-com bubble to late 2007, right before the financial crisis started, uh, well, when the market topped out in 2007. This occurred because that never rebalanced portfolio started with a relatively small allocation to international stocks and emerging market stocks. Mm -hmm. During this five-year period, uh, international stocks outperformed the U.S. by about 4x and emerging markets by about 2x. So if you were rebalancing less frequently and thereby your position in those international stocks was decreasing over time as equities, U.S. equities were rising, then you missed out on this rally, this secular rally, and ultimately that really exposed a big issue with that never rebalance scheme. Yeah, that's really interesting. And it kind of speaks to what advisors are looking at today. Most of them are under allocated to international. And if I recall from the report, you were only, it wasn't globally market cap weighted, your your model portfolios it was 20% international instead of, you know, closer to 50% and then 5% emerging markets. So even with that smaller allocation to a global scale, it really had some impact if you weren't rebalancing there on a more frequent basis. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that's a very fair assessment. All right. So another issue when it comes to rebalancing is the cost of the actual rebalance. What what did you find in your work and what do you want to point out to viewers? Yeah, it was just pointing out that there is, you know, if you thought that monthly rebalancing, let's say you really prioritize keeping those allocations as close to their target as uh, you or your client wants them to be. Well, that's all great. But if you're a small team, if you're an individual advisor, then every single month going in there and rebalancing you know i'm not the most familiar with rebalancing softwares i've heard that they're very powerful and do a great job uh with managing this process but monthly is is very frequent to uh to be going in there and performing this exercise so when we looked over the 25 year period uh think strategies such as that 10 percent drift portfolio over 25 years only rebalanced seven times Now, the 5% drift portfolio ended up being rebalanced 25 times. It wasn't necessarily once per year, but it was over the whole period of the the study. And comparing that to 300 times that you might rebalance if you chose to do it monthly, things like how much time you're spending in that rebalancing software, how much time does that take away from being face-to-face with your clients, uh, things like capital gains that you might be incurring, uh, 
different transaction fees or expenses that, you know, at the end of the day, somehow may be passed on to your client based on your fee structure. Um, these are all things just to consider the opportunity cost of doing something else. When you roll that into the, the realization that there's not a lot of uh, additional risk management provided by rebalancing more frequently, and also those more frequent rebalancing strategies hinder performance slightly, then it's just kind of that trifecta of it's not doing much for risk management. It takes a lot of time to do it. And at the end of the day, we're losing a few points in performance. So of course, there is some merit in rebalancing more frequently if that matches your client's uh, strategy and what they hope to accomplish. But really, I guess this is a warning of maybe pump the brakes on the on the super frequent rebalancing. Yeah. And for a lot of advisors, it makes them feel good, like they're doing something for their clients. But, you know, another component in there is just the bid ass spread. I mean, you're yeah. slowly chipping away at your nest egg if you're rebalancing on a basis uh, on a too frequent basis. Right. Uh, so, Connor, th- I really, really enjoyed this research. I think it's something that advisors can find some actionable items in there for constructing their own models, leveraging the white charts platform. Do you have any concluding thoughts on your takeaways from this report you guys put together? Yeah, you know, it's something that uh, we said in the conclusion of, of this report was just peace of mind can be priceless. And maybe that's something that your clients really value is knowing that, you know, there's nothing in the portfolio, no risky positions that are growing without them, you know, being fully aware. However, using something like Y charts, using this analysis or a, a great visual can communicate to them that there are some cons with maintaining that perfect asset allocation. And there's some potential upside to be had if you do let those winners run a little bit. So I think this is all about having that totally transparent conversation with your clients and saying, these are the allocations that we're discussing. But if we, you know, have a little bit of leniency or or we are a little bit more comfortable, then perhaps some good things will come from it. And with that, you know, definitely welcome advisors to take their portfolios into Y charts and run this similar experiment. It's super easy to duplicate a portfolio and then test it with a different rebalancing frequency, even a different management fee, and then seeing how does that affect a portfolio's uh, performance over the long term, over 10 years, 20 years. And that can lead you to really, uh, you know, instill a new best practice that will maybe save you time and lead to some happier clients as well. Excellent. Connor, I appreciate you coming on and sharing. If you are not currently on the YCharts platform, go grab a free trial at YCharts.com. I promise you, you will not be disappointed. For audio listeners, pick up a copy of this report at go.ycharts.com forward slash rebalance. Of course, if you're watching on YouTube or social media, there will be links in the notes. Connor, thanks so much for coming on. Thank you again, Jay. It was an awesome time. Appreciate it. 